Now, what I want to do now is remind you about hierarchies, uh, hierarchies of resolution. Now, we're talking about plants. Whenever we talk about agriculture, people talk about plants. But the bottom line is agriculture has only a little to do with plants and a lot to do with complex systems. Right now, we operate after the blender at this level. A little bit of genetics and some cell biology, we can make some assertions at this level. We know almost nothing about this level. And we start talking about interactions between individual organisms. We are in very deep kimchi. And complex communities of organisms in the environment, we have almost nothing to say about it as molecular biologists. Ironically, we have to go through this entire gauntlet before we can have dinner. So we go through that, and we imagine then that we're going to have an impact by, by working at this level without appreciating these uh, bottlenecks. Well, of course, that's naive. So what we have to do now is deal with this. How can we make an impact at that level? And the most important part is to appreciate that we're now at a very important threshold in science where we have an option. We have an option to say that reductionism is an enormously powerful fundamental level approach in science, but it is not sufficient. It is absolutely essential and absolutely insufficient to address complex systems. When you look at what Darwin did in, in the sense of, of approaching genetics almost holistically, uh, it, was, it was not at that point reduced to single components, but it was, it was a concept that applied with a broad brush across speciation. Mendel gave us the, in a sense, qualitative or bead-like associations that allowed us to do reductionism on genetics. Very important. What we now need to do in agriculture and environmental work is, and I think also even in, in medical and, and uh, human work, is to go back this way without losing a whit of that rigor. And that's going to be an interesting challenge because of this concept that I want to uh, get you to be aware of. Anytime you make a DNA preparation of virtually any multicellular organism, it inevitably comprises what I call a hologenetic sample of the scaffold genome. Like, I, if I put me in a blender, I'd be a scaffold genome, the thing you see. But in fact, uh, numerous commensal or symbiotic organisms are part of that, and they contribute to the fitness of the complex. Okay? When we say that a, you know, a nude mouse can indeed survive, only in model system environment, if you actually asked it to compete in the field, it wouldn't survive more than a generation. Uh, what we have to do is consider what makes fitness over evolutionary time and natural selection. Well, the evolutionary selected unit, my assertion is, and this is obviously all testable, is that the single organism is rather inconsequential, but a suite of organisms that comprise a performance unit. Now, I have, I have tangible data about this related to actually E. coli and vertebrates, but it's just the same in plants. If you take a plant leaf anywhere in the world and put it down on an Elbroth plate, what you'll get is thousands, literally thousands probably, of different morphological types of bacteria and fungi. And those are just the culturable ones. Uh, the unit basically will have not only sometimes thousands, I suspect many more than thousands of individual genomes in various combinations and numbers. Now, agriculture, again, it, this is a hypothesis, but I think it, there's good circumstantial evidence to support the presentation of the hypothesis, is that it can proceed sustainably only when it's balanced hologenetic combinations are present, or holoalleles. In other words, when the biotic buffering is present in, in such a way that you actually can manage a system that persists with time. Okay, basically that's simply a way of stating in genetic terms that we need complex systems analysis and complex systems. What's interesting is when you pop a plant in a blender, you actually get the entire suite of genomes out. So DNA analysis of plants is not confounded by epi or endophytic organisms. In other words, it's not contamination at all. It's the real thing. That is the suite of genomes that lets that plant survive in nature. And so consequently, we shouldn't avoid it. We should actually seek to understand this and look at it. And we don't have methods that do that well. PCR is going to provide the tools, but it hasn't yet. OK, our methodology is in this regard. Uh, you heard the response to the question about contamination of, of ancient samples by looking only for what you want to see. And this is a perfectly fair response and a fair statement. What happens if we don't know what's there? Does that mean we have to sort of assume that we'll make protist-specific, fungal-specific, nematode-specific, everything-specific primers? Does it mean we'll have to take every sample and clone the samples out and actually say what's there? Well, that would be the reductionist approach. And certainly, it's viable as a proof of principle to do that. I mean, it would be a great PhD project for somebody to grind up one insect and say how many genomes comprise that insect. But it would probably take several years of, of really hard PCR-mediated cloning and sequencing. What we have to do is think of new methods to do that. And that's going to be a challenge for all of us. I certainly don't have a, a trivial answer, but we have to do it because it's essential to deal with the relationship between the logic that nature has imposed in natural selection uh, and the logic we wish to impose on, on our environment and agriculture.